with so many people deconstructing their faith nowadays and trying to understand what church looks like and how to really grow their spiritual walk, I'm going to take a deep dive in this next podcast with my special guest, Jessica Cecil, my fiance, on how we understand church, how we look at growing in the church, lessons, understanding, and looking at red flags. So stay tuned for another episode of Living Fully Fit as we look at how we understand and grow spiritually and become more spiritually fit. Well, welcome to another episode of Living Fully Fit. I'm Coach AJ, and we're looking at another segment where we look and take a deep dive into what it means to be mentally, spiritually, and physically fit. And this segment, we're looking at spiritual fitness, and we're going to be tackling on some tough questions, looking at our personal story, and looking at what it means to grow up in the church and have better understanding, some clear lessons, and to really identify those red flags that we should be looking for. Because again, we're not here to bash the church in a spiritual sense. We're not here to call names or dissuade you from attending or being part of connect of a connected church body. We're trying to get you to be more critical of thinking and to understand and learn from someone else's story here. So tonight's segment, I have a special guest, my beautiful fiance, Jessica. And so we're going to be uh, looking at her background, her story, and giving her perspective of church from a non-clergy person. So Jessica is no way in, in clergy, never had a clergy background, but has a background in nursing and just being a person, you know, being a human being. And I wanted to, you know, kind of interview you and to kind of get your perspective and stuff from your background as a child and teenager. And then, you know, since you and I became members of a church as we were first dating, you know, of your experience in, into that realm, especially our experience in our last church we were at, and kind of just go from there and then just kind of look at some lessons learned and maybe what some of our viewers can understand and grasp and what they can also, you know, learn from your experience and mine as well. Sound good? Sounds great. All right, cool. So tell me, tell our audience a little bit about your background, coming in front, growing up in church. I know you grew up in church to some degree, um, not as in depth as me coming from a, a pastor's background. My grandfather was a pastor and all, but let's go into your childhood in church and what that looked like. Well, I feel like the childhood and church just looks the same for everybody. You know, you're a young child, you are brought to church by your parents, you go to the little kids area or youth group or wherever you're supposed to be at, and then you leave church for the day and you go home. So in our situation, uh, my mom never attended church with us. It was just my dad and I would go to church. Sometimes my brother would come and we would be in our separate rooms, do the lesson for the day, and then just return home. So my biggest thing that I remember is in junior high and high school going to youth group there. And so we did all the fun stuff, the lock-ins, the um, trip to Mexicali. We we were very active. And so that was that was just a lot of fun. Awesome. Um, so basically you kind of saw the kind of the fun side, the, the kind of the nice and clean cut side of church. And little did you know that there were things that church, things that happen in church that you probably weren't aware of until later on, you know, but you mentioned like your youth, you were very close to youth pastor and their thing what about that. What about as a teenager and everything? About being close with my youth pastor? Yeah. Yeah. Seeing, seeing, you know, seeing as a teenager, you're getting a little more maturity. You're seeing a little more inner workings of the church. You're being more involved, that kind of stuff. Okay. So our youth pastor, he and his wife, um, they ran youth group. So we would meet up, you know, once a week at nighttime. My dad was actually very involved with that. Uh, we would do a little bit of worship, have a lesson, hang out. Um, we did lock-ins. It seems like a lot. Um, I remember spending a lot of time at the church and I think that's just because it was a very small town in California. So the thing to do was to actually be at church. Gotcha. And um, it was it was an awesome experience. You know, I never thought of church as anything different except for you come and meet new friends, hang out, talk about Jesus, go home. That that was basically my experience. Okay, so very kind of this very uh, shallow version of what church is like, basically in a way, just kind of safe. You know, it's a safe place. It's fun. I know we can go here. It's a good time. 
learn about Jesus, but overall that's about it. I, I would say that as a child, it definitely set me up for failure with what I know now because mm. going to youth group, it was a very respectable, safe space. It was, mm. we are all here to be kind to one another. We didn't have any drama in our group. We were just a, a group of nerdy kids hanging out, talking about Jesus, and okay. it was great. Yeah, that's awesome. So now that you're an adult and you've experienced a little bit different experience in church, together we've experienced it, especially with me being away in Korea. Um, first of all, let's start off in the beginning of we started attending that church together here in, in Harker Heights area. Mm -hmm. And first impressions, let's talk about those first impressions at first, and then we'll go into like some yellow yellow flags and then red flags and then things you observed before the big red flags came out. Let's go from there, kind of in that order. So I would say whenever we first started going, I mean, it was great. It was, you know, we felt very welcomed. Um, I was very excited to go every Sunday. I felt as though the message was always just very clean cut. This is what I have to say, and I'm going to say it no matter what anybody thought. And so that's that's the type of things that I like to go to, just people that are not afraid to teach in the capacity that they want to teach. Yeah. And so I would say that was the beginning of the green flag is, you know, wow, this pastor is okay with just saying it how it is. Hard conversations. Yeah. Those hard topics people don't want to preach about a lot of times. Absolutely. And, and it was perfect. It was just, okay, this is great. Then, you know, worship was great. Love the music, love the vibe, love the energy. I would say that at the beginning, it was it was awesome. It was very very good. Okay, and then at one point, what uh, we also became members. We went to the membership course. And after that, I think that's where we kind of started seeing things more. For you, what did that look like? What were those first initial like? Huh, what's that about? Kind of stuff. I would say after becoming members. Um, you know, as a nurse, we get called a lot to go to work if yeah. someone calls out, things like that. And so a lot of the times as a nurse, we get a ton of text messages throughout the day. Hey, we need so-and-so to come help out on this unit. And whenever we first became members and I was assisting in the kids ministry, it, it was going very well, but then started realizing how much help and how many times I get texted throughout the day of, hey, who can come out for this event? Who can help with that? Um, and it, it was just very constant. And so as a nurse, I experienced a lot of burnout with that. Yeah. And that's when I began to feel burnout with getting text messages all of the time. And I would say that's whenever the yellow flags kind of started because it just, it kind of felt as though there was a, a business behind things. Very transactional. Yeah. Very transactional, yeah. Um. Because I remember you would like, hey, I got this text. Jesus, this next event and all those kind of things of like that nature. Where I remember you showing me your phone. I'm like, oh my gosh! Like this, this group chat was just insane. Like there's always something going on. It was people last minute asking for help a lot of times too. It was a lot of last minute stuff. And I know you said that from the children's minister. She wasn't the warmest person in the world either. So it was kind of hard to connect and have those conversations like, Hey, you know, some personal space and boundaries here, you know, like, Hey, I, I can't do it. You know? Um, I remember having those conversations with, with you, especially because you're like, I, I still want to serve, but I don't know if I can serve here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's just whenever you have someone who manages a certain area or a department and you have to figure out a way to speak with them, but they are not the most welcoming person. It, it was very difficult because I didn't want to come off as, oh, I don't want to serve this ministry. It, for me, it was more just, I need a little bit of a break. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So besides that, what other like little signs or like amber red flag, am amberish flags were you trying to see? I would say that the... <sighs> It was very inconsistent with how the church congregation started acting towards people. So once we were members and once it kind of looked like we were hooked in, it was not as friendly. People were not as warm and welcoming. Um, they seemed to be more warm and welcoming towards newer faces versus those that you know, have been in the church for a long time or for a couple of months maybe. Um, so that was 
that was a little bit of a red flag for me because I'm a big consistency person. And so once that started to kind of dwindle, I was just kind of like, hmm, you know, what is this about? And then I started noticing little things from the pastor, um, just me being the person that I am within the medical field. Um, it kind of bothers me sometimes whenever someone uses a statistic or a verse or something in that aspect to benefit whatever point they're trying to get across. Mm. And I started really noticing those things. And so I'm a very observant person. Give an example, like something that the, that the pastors had said that triggered that. I was like, whoa, what's up with that? There was, I'm trying to remember the exact thing that we were discussing, but the pastor had used about um, heart disease and how it's, he didn't use it as the number one killer in America. And I know for a fact that it is still number one. He had placed something else. Um, I want to say it was loneliness. I think that's what we were discussing. We were discussing loneliness and how we needed to be in the church and how we can't do church online, how we need to be in the church, be with people, and not be lonely. I always find that funny. We can't do church online, but we have church online. I don't know. It is very insane. <laughs> then don't have, don't have church online. If you don't want people to have church online, then don't have that little way of doing that. You know, yeah. get rid of it. I have no idea what was going on that day. I was just more so very stuck on that for a while. Yeah. And it became very difficult for me to follow through with the rest of the sermon because I fixated on that. And I was just like, hmm, okay, I wonder if there's any more of that. And there were... I don't have any specific examples. My memory sometimes isn't the most awesome, but um, no. No. Yes, no. we know. <laughs> but that was kind of the first one that I was kind of starting to question things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know, like, there's those moments there. I know, like, for instance, the, this pastor we've worked we worked with and saw, and and we were part of this church. I remember you would mention to me like that he reminded you of this other personality that you worked with. Like the, he reminds me of my old boss who was very narcissistic and I'm like, Oh, what? he's just, that's his personality. I'm like, I don't see it. But you know, looking back now and when you're on the outside looking in, you see like, Oh yeah, I can see that now that a personality, that very, very aggressive personality. I think at first it's attractive because it's very charismatic. It comes off very charismatic and knowledgeable and people like, Oh, they, people like just someone who just tells them how it is, you know, until they don't. Until until it hits you in the face, you're like, well, geez, that was kind of harsh and rough and lack of lack of em empathy. And I think that's the sad thing. There's a lot of pastors that are like that, you know, and a lot of people that are like that. That at first, you know, they think that those, those traits look attractive, but then when you see it turned around against you and you see it hurting people, especially, those traits are no longer attractive. Those traits are very toxic. You know, I think at first, you know, those th things can be used for good if they're used for good. But I think a lot of times they're used to manipulate and push people and to really honestly drive a narrative sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, after that, it just kind of went even further downhill with you leaving and going over to Korea. And I was really struggling with you being gone. And I had a lot of intrusive thoughts coming in. And I was just like, wow, you know, maybe I should ask my pastor about this. And so one day after the sermon, I stayed, waited my turn to be able to speak with our pastor. And the first thing that was said was, hey, where's your man at? And it really kind of took me back because I said, well, you know, he's gone. You know, we had been discussing this for months before yeah. you had left. And for that to be the first thing, I was like, oh, okay. You know, maybe he just doesn't remember. Yeah. You know, busy person. I understand. But I had asked for just some Bible verses. What can I do with intrusive thinking and all of these things? And I was told to send an email. Um, so that there could be a reminder and he could get back to me. Well, I sent the email and it's been a year now. No email. You'll probably never get that. I email. won't ever get an email and that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> and honestly, I, I, the sad thing is with him, I think if you had some kind of value to him, 
you know, which I think we've learned is that people like that and experiences like that, it's, it's what you bring to the table. And I guess to him, you probably didn't bring anything to his table. So he didn't feel like pursuing that to help you feel, you know, valued and understood and trying to help your situation, you know, cause like, obviously he didn't realize I was gone. You know, he's thinking, oh, he's probably sleeping in. Where's your guy at? <laughs> you know, he's at home, right? Bring him to church. He needs to hear the Lord. You know, that's that's the sad thing is I think, you know, he didn't realize that. But for and – I, and I get it. You're, he's one person. There's hundreds of people he talks to. But then again, we weren't just anybody. We were very involved in that church, you know, sitting in the front row for the last year and a half, two years. So that's that's another big thing too. It's not, It wasn't like just we're in the background hiding but we were very involved. That's the part that's just, I think it's, you know, interesting and intriguing about the whole situation. It was, it was very interesting. And, you know, with what I was doing with the kids ministry and what you were doing with worship team, that was a bigger shock to me yeah. because people knew that you were gone. Um, but you know, what really took me a moment to realize was there are times that this pastor would mention, if you have an issue within the church, I'm going to pull your tithe first. And so when I look back at it, I think, well, maybe he looked back and realized I I didn't tithe, I guess, appropriately. But then again, I'm the person that puts cash in a bucket and yeah. not putting my name to a check. Therefore, no one would really ever know. And that's sad because you think about how many people do that. There's probably a lot of people that do that, that probably give in that capacity because they don't want attention. They don't want the recognition or the accolades from that. And and what's sad is that people are assuming, well, we don't see them tithe, so that we're not going to really love on them or take care of them or consider them in leadership because we don't see their name on a check, so they don't consider that. And they might be the best influential leader that that church can have, but they're missing out, you know? Um, and I, I'm not saying that, you know, you are the criminal crime, but yeah, I think you are, <laughs> <Thank> you. <laughs> but I think, you know, the, the church, you know, missed an opportunity there, you know, for good leader and good person to be, to integrate into the leadership there, into the people there. And I think how many other people have missed, they missed on that opportunity with, you know, how many other people that they've, you know, disregarded and discarded because of whatever ever reason, because they're focused on their tunnel vision or they're focused on what they deem as important. You know what I mean? Um, so continuing on our, your, your, your journey there. So there were a bunch of other, you know, little flags that happened. So as, as it, you know, increased in intensity and as things became, I guess, not just like a better word, worse, where were the things that started like, okay, I need to probably start stepping back. Cause I know you, you moved campuses because mm -hmm. of the church we went to was like a multi-campus church. So um, what did that start looking like that transition? What kind of caused you to start moving towards that way? Well, for me, it was a friendship had ended or what I thought was a friendship. Um, apparently there were people gossiping about me. And to be honest, I have no idea what the gossip even was. Um, why, what I do remember is the last, well, the last thing I remember was people started asking if you and I were living together, not being married, and that kind of seemed to trickle down into whatever had come next. Yeah. And so I had a friendship that ended, and I just felt very unsupported and alone there. So I did switch over campuses to where I did know more people, had more friends, and, you know, whenever I walked through those doors, it was very, very different. It's like night and day. Right? Oh, absolutely. The energy was completely different. People were very kind, but it seemed genuine. It was the kindness where people really were happy to see you. It wasn't, I'm happy to see you because you're a new face. It was, mm -hmm. I'm happy to see you because you're in church. And so that felt really, really good. And I did the same thing. I sat in the front row, enjoyed, you know, met new people did the whole entire thing. And so I did that for a little bit there and ended up bringing one of my good friends there and she still continues to, um, to attend. Yeah. Yeah. And then from there, where did it go south? From there, it went south because we had a situation where we had discussed, um, revoking our membership at one location so that we could go to a different location. Yeah. And whenever that was said, um, leadership had 
gotten back to us saying that I was not allowed to attend another church of theirs because I had issues with someone at their main campus in which I wasn't even too sure what the issue was or who the issue was with. It's an assumption. You know, that's what it boils down to is an assumption that, well, you left because of an issue. So we need, we need, you need to fix it before you're able to go attend this church. Like, well, is that in the rules? Do I need to? I don't remember signing that part of the membership contract. Yeah, I, I have no idea. I guess there was just a lot of assumptions. I mean, you know how it is having a Facebook account where if you post something that is just your own inner workings and thoughts and people like to take your ideas and run with it and just assume that you're speaking badly about their church oh, or totally. their place of work. Has that happened to you? Oh my goodness, multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> Being attacked on Facebook by keyboard warriors is just the greatest thing. Um, but, you know, that did occur and I did send private messages to those people in which it didn't go anywhere. And once you have a conversation that is no longer fruitful because someone has their opinion and someone else has their opinion, it's better to just end the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's not to say that I'm right, you're wrong. It's just we both have a difference of opinions, which is completely okay. And we're not going to get anywhere with this. And it's going to lead to name calling and other things. And so I just ended the conversation, um, went back to that leadership person that reached out to us and also reached out to the pastor of that newer campus in which that did not go the greatest way either because that pastor decided I'm stepping back and you can handle this issue. And so that was very discouraging for me because I had previously spoken with that pastor on the phone and at that time, he seemed very supportive. Yeah. But then when it came down to the actual conversation, it was very much so tail between the legs going in the other direction. Ah, uh, gotcha. So it was very discouraging. Um, and then after that, people who were in this gossip group um, started going to that um, that location because there are other events, of course, that occur like worship nights, baptisms, things like that. Yeah, yeah. And they were at that location. Um, during that time, they just kept looking at me <laughs> just very inappropriately. And they were just quite rude. Yeah. And I don't feel as though anybody should feel that way in church. No, so, it should be, a, again, a safe place. Church should be a place where you feel welcomed and loved and safe because the world's already crappy as it is. So the gathering of God should be a very safe place, You you would think at least. Um, so before we continue these experiences here, if you weren't, you know, founded in your relationship with God, the way you are, do you think that those situations would have pushed you out? Oh, absolutely. And that's just because again, this was my first experience as an adult within a church. I had no idea that you were supposed to become members. I didn't know any of this. I thought, you know, we just showed up at a building. Let's worship God. <laughs> you know, let's let's meet each other. Let's have dialogue. Let's discuss, learn. And that's what I thought that church was about. I did not realize that there was this inner networking of almost borderline cultish behavior that, that went along with the church. I had I had no idea. But I am thankful that I do read my Bible on my own, and I'm thankful that I do have the relationship that I have with God, because otherwise, that really would have pushed me in the direction of, oh, so this is what Christianity really is. Yeah, exactly. You know, I think about this, you know, people that are walking into those church doors or any church like that, for that matter, you know, they they run the risk because, you know, think about someone brand new in their faith, or maybe they, they've experienced church hurt in their past. They get to a church like that, and then they experience what they experience right there, or what you experienced, what I experienced. That could push someone off the edge. That could push someone off to a no religion or no religion or no faith at all um, to totally deconstruct their faith. I mean, that's why I think the de whole deconstruction thing is a big thing right now is because of that very reason. Deconstruction is a popular mindset and thought process and belief right now because – the church has pretty much lost its way. And I think if we don't, if we're not careful and we're not, you know, wise and discerning, we could be like that too, honestly. If we're not going into a church with 
eyes wide open with a critical mind and with wisdom, you know, and luckily you're the kind of personality you ask questions, mm -hmm. you know, you don't just go in there like, well, screw this by, you know, like, is this supposed to happen? Why is this happening this way? What's going on? You're asking those questions that helps kind of, you know, really kind of flesh out a lot of that stuff, you know, and I think for a lot of people that don't, and that's why we're doing this podcast here is because so many people, you know, don't have these kind of conversations and don't know where to start with these kind of conversations, don't want, know where to go and ask the right question about the church they're attending, about the faith group they're belonging to. And here's the thing is I don't think you should quit church. I'm not saying you should quit church. I think church is an essential and important thing, but it's about being discerning about choosing the right church for you and for your family. A church that's actually doing the right things and actually being in the community and building the body of Christ. That's what the church should be doing. Um, and the reason why we're having this story of you sharing your story, you know, this whole idea of lessons learned and understanding and identifying red flags is, you know, that way other people can learn from your story and kind of figure out what to look for. Um, so before we kind of continue here in a little bit, would kind of just cause you to stop in, attending there is so – the, the big question I want to ask for all this is what were, what are some things you've learned through these situations and circumstances that you could probably share with people that they can learn from what some things to look out for, I guess. Mm. Well, I mean, I guess my opinions are of course going to differ from everybody else's. Okay. Um, but with what I've experienced, I am personally going to be a little bit more weary of people that are just overly excited to say hello to me. And I know that sounds so weird. It's love bombing. But it's it, love bombing in a way, you know? It's very, very weird. The, oh, hello, my name is such and such. And I cannot believe that you're here today. You look beautiful. You're gorgeous. Come on in. Let's talk about Jesus. And I'm like, okay. You know, it's it's very, very weird and overwhelming, especially because me, I'm a little bit of an introvert, extrovert. And so when people come at me in that type of way, I'm already a little bit standoffish. Yeah. I think the other thing that I'm going to look at is the building in itself, how much money people are spending on the building, because going into a church that looks overly expensive to me, it just kind of seems like it's putting off of a business vibe mm. versus let's talk about Jesus. I would much rather meet out at the park. You know, I, yeah. I tell you this a lot. It's very interesting how there are so many buildings to go talk about Jesus. There are so many churches in this area, and we're supposed to be talking about this one person. But whenever you read the Bible, when you go to these different places, they all have a different different interpretation yeah, absolutely. Of, of who Jesus was and what we're supposed to do. And so... You know, whenever we go along looking for a new church, definitely wanting to try different churches because people are going to have different interpretations, even though we're supposed to be learning about just one God. Should be the same Jesus across the board, you know. It should be. But, you know, we have some some Jesuses that believe in the spirit of Ahab and some Jesuses that, you know, believe that it's okay to love homosexuals and some Jesuses that, you know, whatever. It's it's very interesting the, how we have a different Jesus that comes out of this one book. And so that's that's just my interpretation of all of this. But I would also say just monitoring how people are within the church, you know, the consistency. I would look at the pastor. Does he bring his Bible up there and actually open it? Not just bring it up there to set it on a stool, but does he actually open up his Bible? Yeah. Does he rely on the slides too much? You know, in school, we called it death by PowerPoint. Are we going to deal with that in church or are we going to watch someone up there who actually opens up their Bible and reads from it? Actually understands it and is able to explain mm -hmm. the scripture. Right. And not their opinion of the scripture. Right. And that's the thing I, I saw a lot of, not just that church, but many churches that I worked at in the past was you see a lot of these pastors who will preach on their opinion mm -hmm. and they'll add a scripture or two and kind of intermingle it. And it's it's hard to differentiate the truth when you have that. When you intermingle scripture and opinion, it's really hard to, to determine which one is 
the separate thing. You know, well, which one is scripture? Which one is their opinion? It, it sounds so good together that you can't tell them apart, honestly. And that's a dangerous thing because if I don't read my Bible regularly, don't dig deep and understand it myself, I could just pick up what he, that person says, like, oh, that must be in the Bible somewhere. Yeah, yeah, you know, and just go along with it. And that's exactly something else that I had noticed there. It was more so, well, pastor said this. And I would say, okay, well, let's discuss this more. And that person would not be able to discuss it any further. It was, pastor said this, period. That's it. And you can tell people that didn't read their Bible and, or maybe take what pastor did say and then go home and dive deeper into it. They didn't do their own research. Yeah, It was very much so, this is what he said and therefore it's law. And that was definitely a red flag for me It's just people that don't do their own research or don't dive in and have their own relationship with God. Gotcha. And so I, I look at you talking about earlier, you know, saying that there was, you know, gossip and mm-hmm. people kind of talking to you a certain, as in a certain way. And obviously, you know, the, the pastor influencing people's mindset and how they see the Bible and everything. So all these things kind of just added up, you know, to, kind of drive you to the decision you made about, you know, leaving that church and everything. Um, I know, for instance, you said you that they had the relationship that kind of also drove you away from that church a little bit too, because it became kind of like a toxic relationship as well. Right. Um, but where did, the, how do those kind of connect in a way, you know, because I know they all do connect. I know they connect, but, mm-hmm. you know, to someone who doesn't understand the story as well, you know, since I've, you know, we're together. So I hear your stories, but someone who can, you know, un- kind of understand your story, how these connect and how they do connect. They do connect, you know, cause it's something that people can be realized as they enter a church and see, well, this overly friendly person connects to this person over here. This gossip connects to this pastor here. How in your minds, in your way, in your observation, how do they all connect? Well, to me, they would all connect because you have, let's say this, this head of household person, um, which is generally going to be your senior pastor. And so you have this head of household person who is very charming, who is very convincing, and they're teaching you every Sunday. They become someone that you trust and they make everything sound great. And so, wow, okay, this is, this is what it says. This person can be trusted. But then whenever you have someone like that in a position of power and able to influence others, that's whenever it gets dangerous because they will start believing everything they say. And so whenever gossip starts and you have this head of household person who also gossips within a group of other head of household people, um, you have this group that will then spread the gossip and that's whenever other people in the congregation will be like, oh, well, pastor said this rumor and gossip. It must be true. Even though pastor should not be gossiping, yeah, um, it, it still does occur. And so that's how it all intertwines and it kind of falls down from leadership. You know, there's that saying of attitude reflects leadership. Yeah. And it's very much so true because anytime that I had pointed something out that was interesting in a sermon to this person that I thought was my friend, she would then say, well, maybe this place isn't for you. And that shouldn't be the first reaction. No. It would be, oh, okay, let's talk about this more. You have your own opinion because you're your own independent human being. You're not just this cog in the machine of the church. And so that's kind of what I noticed. Again, it to me, it started to feel very cult-like mind um, where people would just believe what this leadership head of household person would say yeah that's that's unfortunate and honestly kind of dangerous Mm -hmm. you know because it's like well they said it so i believe it and there's no questions asked and then when it ends up happening is when you know questions are being asked you're shut down you know shut down or you're you're honestly kind of gaslit to believe that well it's it's probably you you're you're probably the problem you need to find somewhere else to go (laughs) well i mean the other thing that you have to think about is you have to think about the type of people that 
do start going to church, especially newcomers, a lot of the time it's going to be people that have hit their bottom, you know, people that are looking to start a better life, you know, so yeah, absolutely. you're looking at the mentally ill population, you're looking at alcoholics, you're looking at all these different types of people who are finally looking at maybe their friends or maybe people online like, wow, what do they have that I don't? And most of the time it's, wow, this person goes to church and they know Jesus. Maybe I need to give that a go. Yeah. So whenever you have that person come into the church and you have, let's just call it for what it is, a narcissistic leader and someone who's very charming, they are going to recognize people who are in that low place and they are going to- They're vulnerable. They're very vulnerable and they're going to manipulate them. Yeah. And in my mind, that is what happened at that specific church is it was a very charming person who- almost in a sense prayed on a vulnerable person yeah and that's it and I, th I see that a lot you know and, and almost every church i've been at where there is you have that pastor who's you know charismatic you know charming very easy to get along with on the outside and it's usually the staff that sees the truth a lot of times um sometimes not not always sometimes you have the staff that are part of that shenanigans as well you know but you also see that our that those people that tend to protect that pastor are the vulnerable ones that have been hurt. And that pastor has kind of helped them through stuff right. a lot of times. They, they, or they feel like they have, well, that, you don't understand pastor helped me through so much. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. But my always question is like, well, why you and, and why, why are you special? But everyone else he's disregarded, right. you know, why are you special? But you know, like your, your question for him is like, Hey, I need some help with intrusive thoughts. And then, Oh yeah. Send me an email. Come blow you off. Yeah. Send me an email peasant. Yeah. Basically. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and then you hear nothing crickets, you know, except like, Oh, where's your man at? Right. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's only been on stage, you know, every, every Sunday for a, for a whole two years, you know, whatever. <laughs> Forget him. where did he go? idea <laughs> you know I, that's the thing is like and i, and I don't want to get into a tangent of just talking bad about the church like i said we're not talking bad we're just kind of sharing stories of experiences here and we're, we're going to kind of transition here to lessons learned so here's the experiences you experienced mm -hmm. what are some lessons learned going forward you know lessons learned for you but also lessons learned that you can share with others to benefit and to avoid some pitfalls in the future well i would say that honestly what i've learned is really anything you can even bring to any relationship that you have it's always recognizing that not every place is going to be the same not every relationship is going to be the yeah. same and just because one place ended up being negative, it doesn't mean that the next place will either. It just gives you these ideas of, okay, what occurred here that I can see if the same pattern exists somewhere else? Yeah. And I can just be more mindful of that. Because again, this being my first adult experience in this, I was just thinking, oh, okay, all, all these buildings are basically the same, non-denominational. Okay, we're going to talk about Jesus and it should all be good. But whenever I started to realize the inner workings of it, it did become frustrating. And I was like, well, you know, maybe another place will be different. And so that's yeah. my hope is that another place will be different. You know, never stop trying to go to different places and definitely try different places. You know, everybody is going to be different wherever you go. And yeah, that's, totally. that's the beauty of having all of these wonderful church buildings is you're not just supposed to go to one and if you don't like it you give up no you're supposed to try the others there are always going to be other options out there and so i would definitely encourage that try in other places until you feel as though things are consistent and that would be my biggest word is and consistency and healthiness just that everybody is the same every single sunday you know they're always happy to see you will always tell you hi. You know, you're not going to have to worry about the pastor gossiping about you, that type of stuff. Um, yeah, that's really it. Yeah. So it's basically just, you know, just kind of being discerning and praying for the next step. Um, and I say, you know, as we are looking at our journey and, and finding the right church family, right, the right church community, that's the thing is like the church community. Does it have to be a fancy building? Does it have to be anything 
you know, significantly wow from the outside. It's about the inside with inner workings of the people who you interact with. You know, are they people who stand on character, stand on, you know, actually being the hands and feet of Jesus? You know, I think there are some still good people in that church, you know, a lot of good people there that are attending. And, you know, and for whatever reason, God has them there, you know. I'm not saying I, I've never told people to leave that church or, or, or should they? And I don't think even some of our friends have told that I love the church too. I have to quickly leave that church. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, you should be prayerful of what church you go to and be mindful and prayerful of where you attend, where you call home for a church. But I think, you know, it's, it's all a matter of, you know, does this place serve the community? Does it serve Jesus mm-hmm. and not should it serve you? Cause I think we, we, we could, that is a dangerous spot of, well, I'm not happy and we're just consumers. I'm not happy. So I'm going to go away, which I don't know. I know that's not what you're saying, mm-hmm. you know? And I think we have to be very careful and cognizant of making sure that we're not consuming one, st- one place to another. Like, well, this place isn't serving me. So I'm going to try another place. I'm not happy. I'm going to try another place. It's about, you know, find a place that is like you said, consistent mm-hmm. in what they say versus what they do. I think that's where we saw a lot of red flags in this last church was, what they say did not match what they did, especially in a lot of the people in leadership, especially not the, not the lowly, just kind of attender or minor member. I'm talking about the people who in, who are in leadership who are on platform, who you saw regularly doing stuff, taking photos or, you know, doing sound or being on stage. Mm-hmm. They said one thing, but they did other things. Right. And I think that's the thing that you have to look out for in a church is the lesson learned is, what do do they match what they say and what they do? You know, that's that's the whole idea of being spiritually healthy and spiritually discerning is identifying those two things. If they don't connect, there's no interconnection there of action and word, then you probably need to start asking yourself, why am I here and should I go somewhere else? You know, I think this is the whole premise of your story, of your experiences as an adult in church, especially is making sure people match what they say. You know, and and being that being you know in a community that doesn't love you, and until you become a member, that's like that isn't just loving and kind and empathetic to you until you cross that that dotted line, and then okay, well you're part of it. Okay, see ya, keep going. And I think that's that was kind of your experience a little bit, right? Yeah, that was definitely my experience. And you know, another thing is definitely also looking at your own relationship with God, you know, being able to take whatever the pastor says, go home, really dive more into it, and then being able to ask questions. So I feel as though if you can't go back to your pastor or you can't go to other people and ask a certain question about maybe what you've read, even if it isn't the same idea that maybe the pastor has said, you know, hey, pastor said this, but this is how I interpreted and read this. What are your thoughts? If someone immediately just gets mad at you or says, well, that's not the way that pastor said it, then to me, that would be another issue. No red flag. Absolutely. It would be that thought of, I can't think for myself, that I have to be the ostrich with my head in the sand and only believe in what this pastor says. Yeah, absolutely. That's good. That's that's a good thing to understand and for people to grasp. And so uh, in closing, um, I just want to say thank you for your input and insight on this and sharing your story. Mm -hmm. This is our first time doing a podcast, (laughs) so this was really cool. Um, but hopefully to you, this helps you kind of ask those right questions as you're looking at your own spiritual growth and discerning what that looks like. And don't be, don't be discouraged that maybe you've had a few experiences that have been really crappy and you're just like, oh, that, that's, that didn't feel good. You know, that didn't feel right. It It's part of human nature because no church is perfect because no human is perfect, but you should be looking for churches that at least identify their imperfection and are striving to be better. That's the main thing. So hopefully this kind of segment helped help you, helps you out, helps you grow, helps you become more spiritually healthy and spiritually aware. But if you enjoy content like this, make sure to go ahead and subscribe down below, hit the notification bell, hit the like button, and make sure to share with someone who can benefit from content like this. Thanks for watching for another episode of Lean Fully Fit. I'm Coach AJ with my guest, Jessica Cecil. And we'll see you in another episode of Living Fully Fit with Coach AJ.
Thanks for watching.